better word than expect. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Appreciate the chance to uh, join the panel. Congratulations uh, to Commissioner Olhausen. Uh, you know, the agenda that you set out, the Economic Liberty Task Force, I think it's been a tremendous success. It's been great to see that work getting done. Uh, I am relatively new at the FCC as a commissioner, at least. I was sworn in in August, but I joined the agency as a staffer back in 2012, uh, originally in the Office of General Counsel, and then I worked for then Commissioner Pai uh, on spectrum and wireless issues for him for three years. And then in January, uh, I became the General Counsel of the FCC and did that for about eight months before uh, moving into this job as one of the commissioners in the majority at the FCC. And I'm really hopeful for uh, the work that we have ahead of us at the agency. When I was going through the confirmation and the nomination process for this job, what struck me, what I focused on, is really the tremendous opportunity that we have in tech and telecom to put the right policies in place that are going to create jobs, that are going to spur investment, and that are going to lead to greater broadband deployment across the country for all Americans, and we are moving steadily ahead with those policies already. And in terms of the job creation, I mean, that's really the lens through which I view almost all the policies that we do at the FCC. And my very first trip that I took as a commissioner was down to um, a small town, Claremont, North Carolina. There's a manufacturing plant there that actually manufactures the fiber optic and other high-speed cables that are used for broadband. So when we talk in D.C. about policies that are going to spur greater broadband deployment, in my mind, that's where it starts. We create jobs in plants like that across the country, creating the actual broadband. And then on the deployment side, we have construction crews that go out and pull fiber, trench conduit, hang antennas, good paying jobs on that side of it as well. And then obviously, in terms of big economic impact, once we get that broadband actually deployed to consumers, there's the app economy that runs over that. There's the opportunity that comes from the end user from having that connection. And so we're focused really at the commission on spurring greater broadband deployment and seeing how we can help uh, add to the job creation that's out there. Let me ask a, a question that really is, I, I think, a background to both uh, your remarks. And that is, uh, are you satisfied at the moment with the uh, institutional role of economics in your commissions? In other words, is, has I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the role of that, of the economic analysis yeah. in the... Or, or lack thereof sometimes. Well, <laughs> I was thinking of, of the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, where it is really established in a very, uh, I shouldn't say concrete way, but a, a fairly secure way. Are there, are there similar arrangements in your commissions, and uh, uh, are, there, are there additional moves you think might be helpful? Yeah, I'll, I'll start for the, for the FCC at least. Yeah, we need to get better at economic analysis, economic rigor, cost-benefit analysis, and we're moving very steadily in that direction. Uh, our chairman, Chairman Pai, has announced that we are exploring the creation of an office of economics and data. We have a lot of econom uh, economists inside the building at the FCC. They are dispersed right now among some operating bureaus. So the idea here is you create a new office of economics that brings some or all of those Econom economists into one office, and that structurally, that'll help give them some additional independence so they can be a stronger check on the work of the agency. So it's not simply supporting the policy cuts 100% of the time, it's stepping back, just like we have an Office of General Counsel that sort of is a check legally on the work of the bureaus. If we can consolidate some or all the economists into a separate standalone office, I think that's going to bring some independence and some uh, additional rigor on the cost benefit and economic side. We're fortunate at the FTC. We have three main bureaus, the Bureau of Competition, the Bureau of Consumer Protection, and the Bureau of Economics. The Bureau of Economics has over 70 PhD economists who give us their recommendations on the actions that we take. And they've primarily focused uh, for a long time on antitrust. And anyone who practices modern antitrust law knows economics are at the heart of it. Uh, and we also have economists uh, who focus on consumer protection, and they've been very helpful in things like designing disclosures and, and uh, uh, estimating what's the right amount of consumer harm that may have occurred. But one of the things that I've wanted to do is to increase the focus uh, in the, our uh, assessment of privacy 
uh, and to use economics more to get a better uh, understanding of what is the value of privacy, what are the kinds of harms that privacy violations can inflict on consumers, and how do we balance, balance those. Uh, so I've tried to move this forward in, in two ways. Uh, every year we do a conference called PrivacyCon, where we bring in researchers to focus on their research in the privacy area. And a lot of it in the past has focused on white hat hackers and people who are finding flaws. And I said, well, I want more of an economics focus this year. So I want it to be called Privacy Econ. <laughs> and so we're, we, we're asking more uh, economics questions. And then I'm holding a workshop next month on informational injury. You know, we've done so much work in the privacy space at the FTC Privacy and Data Security, and there's a good understanding that when your financial information is exposed, you might be subject to financial fraud. You know, your bank account might be cleared out, or identity theft, or something like that. But are there other types of informational injuries when your medical records are exposed, or, or some, something like that, that might also be causing consumers a harm? We've brought cases against Ashley Madison um, for exposing data, and the harms there went beyond just financial harms. People actually committed suicide when that information was exposed. So I wanted to bring a little more rigor uh, using the economic lens to this type of assessment. Uh, actually, that, that leads into another question. And both commissions have authority over mergers in some contexts. And uh, there, there are claims that one reads that this is sometimes used to secure uh, agreement of the merging firms to uh, commitments, restraints on their behavior that are not either related to antitrust values or, in the extreme case, not even related to uh, the statutory mission. And, uh, in the nature of things, these would seem unlikely to get reviewed because either the parties give up the merger, that seems to be the end of it, uh, and, and there's no chance in an appeal being settled in time to get the merger through, or they get the merger, in which case they may not be perfectly happy, uh, but at least they feel they're ahead of where they would have been without the merger. So it's a sort of a subterranean part of administrative law. Well, at the, at the FTC, uh, you know, we're reviewing under the FTC Act and uh, for mergers under the Clayton Act and pursuing the consumer welfare standard, the idea that what we're trying to look at is are consumers going to be, you know, be better off economically uh, from, from uh, this transaction or is it going to restrict competition and, and make consumers wor worse off? Uh, we, uh, I personally have very much pushed back against the idea that we're supposed to put in non-economic values into a merger review or non-consumer welfare values into a merger review to say uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, should we have privacy as a freestanding value in a merger review? And I, I've pushed back against that. Unless the entities are competing on privacy, uh, you wouldn't say, oh, well, uh, I think we should prevent this merger because they're going to combine complementary data sets and create some new product, and, and I think that's bad for consumers when we normally would say that's an efficiency and it should count in, in, favor, in favor of that deal. Um, so I, uh, I think it's a, a problem that there is uh, right now a big discussion and debate trying to put non-economic values or non-consumer welfare values in, into a merger. But with that being said, uh, Protecting competition in markets also protects non-money values, right? If it's something that consumers value, whether it's quality or variety of viewpoints or, or some other attribute, market forces should, should protect that. Yeah, I'll simply say, you know, when you look back at the merger reviews that the FCC has done historically, I think you've seen an agency over the last couple of years that started to stray pretty far from the statutory role and our own precedent in this area, which is to say, a merger that comes to the FCC, it's not Christmas. It's not time to see how many goodies can we jam through as a condition to approving this deal. Our precedent is actually very clear on this. What you do is you look at the merger and you see, is there a specific transaction-specific harm that's gonna arise from this? If so, you look and see, is there a remedy that addresses that particular harm? I think where the FCC got over the last couple of years was it would attempt to identify any type of harm and then once there was one harm, it was, okay, what are all the things that we can then pile onto this and then we can say, net, net, 
we think these things are unrelated to the harm, but overall we're okay with it because of these goodies that we're getting. I don't think that's consistent with the statute. I don't think it's consistent with the commission's precedent. And I think we now have a majority of the commission that's going to be much more disciplined uh, when it comes to reviewing these transactions. Um, Commissioner Carr, I understand that you have uh, expressed an interest in developing policy to promote uh, quicker deployment of wireless. Uh, could you could you tell us what form uh, that would take? Yeah. So uh, Chairman Pai two weeks ago asked me to take the lead at the FCC on our broad efforts on wireless infrastructure deployment. Uh, and in my mind, it's an important issue. So right now, we're in the middle of a transition uh, in the technology for wireless. Right now, you're all familiar with we have something called 4G. Uh, LTE service. From a network perspective, we're moving to something called 5G. And just briefly, uh, to describe the type of transition I'm talking about, right now we have relatively few antenna sites around the country, roughly 300,000. We need to go for 5G pretty quickly to over a million. Uh, instead of having these single macro cell sites that covered 20, 30 miles, uh, 5G, in addition to that, is going to be layered in with what we call small cells, which are, you know, covering much smaller areas, use a different spectrum band, uh, and increase the capacity of the network. So we're going to see higher speeds, lower latency. To get there, to get that massive deployment, we need to get about $275 billion invested in the networks from the private sector. But if we do it, it's going to create about 3 million new jobs associated with this deployment. Uh, and right now, the regulatory framework that we have in place in my mind, is going to be the bottleneck that holds us back from getting there. The U.S. right now leads the world in 4G. If we're going to lead in 5G, we've got to reform the deployment rules that apply. That's both state and local rules that apply. Uh, we have tribal review mechanisms that are at issue. We have environmental historic preservation. We have federal rules. So right now, the FCC has a broad proceeding where we're looking at each of these areas, uh, and we've took a small action last month to help streamline it. We've got other actions teed up in the coming months, but that's really where I'm going to try to focus the most of my time inside the building is in all of these areas, how do we get that streamlining? And then just real quick, it, it, the streamlining isn't just about how do we move faster. It really is about serving areas that wouldn't get it otherwise. There's a study that says if we reform our infrastructure deployment rules, that's going to incentivize uh, additional deployment. It's going to cover about 26.7 million new homes would get covered with, five, with, with fiber in this instance that wouldn't otherwise be economical for the private sector to serve simply because money be wasted uh, in the deployment process. So we've got to get this done to lead, and we also have to get it done so that these new services are deployed much more ubiquitously and not simply in sort of urban affluent areas. Are there any obstacles to these improvements other than sort of the creaky, archaic rules? I think that's a, that's a big piece of it. You yeah. know, state and local, tribal, environmental, historic, federal, I mean, there's so many hoops that you have to go through to deploy wireless infrastructure. And it's amazing, because when you compare wireless infrastructure hanging an antenna to similar types of infrastructure deployments, wireless has been uniquely singled out for layers of review that don't apply to other types of deployment. So we've really got to focus in. So, so are these rules uh, ones of the FCC, which the FCC can therefore remove or modify? Yeah, a, a portion of them are FCC rules. Some are state and local where the FCC has authority to work with uh, state and local governments to streamline their rules. Some are uh, environment historic that are go through the ACHP, which is a, uh, an advisory council that does with historic preservation. They have their own rules. So we have a role to play in uh, many different areas, um, but they are sort of distinct areas. Yes, yes. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, this is an obvious question for uh, the two of you. Uh, to the extent that your jurisdictions overlap, uh, are you to foresee changes in protocols to the extent there are protocols now to uh, minimize conflict and uh, accelerate pursuing the public interest? So the, the FTC's authority does overlap with the FCC's authority, and it overlaps with a lot of other agencies as well. And what we try to do is operate through... It used to overlap even more. I know. I'll get, okay. I'll get to that. I'll strong arm you on that. Uh, but the... Uh, so we have memorandum of understanding where we try to divide up things to make sure that we're not uh, engaging in duplicative or, or inconsistent enforcement. 
Uh, and one of the areas I think we've done a very good job in is robocalling, right? So the FTC, the FTC has tried to bring uh, you know, a lot of resources to bear. You know, we have the do not call rule. We've uh, you know, brought a lot of enforcement actions under telemarketing sales rule. Uh, but the FCC is also trying to help uh, allow the carriers to take further steps to, protect, to provoke, uh, prevent uh, inappropriate ro robocalling. Uh, and the FTC filed a comment uh, on that. Um, also, the FTC's brought enforcement actions. Uh, for example, uh, we kept the FCC in the loop on our investigation and the AT&T cramming investigation. And then the final settlement that we had, which included the uh, all 50 states, also included the FCC, and it enabled us to return more than $88 million to consumers. Uh, but one of the issues that has really been on, on the, the front burner is the fact that when the FCC reclassified broadband as a Title II service, it divested the FTC of authority over, the, over that because we have a common carrier exemption. And what that means is the, the FTC has long been the privacy cop on the beat and you know, advertising enforcer and, and uh, you know, sort of looking at you know, the marketplace. Uh, and we effectively got removed from that beat when uh, reclassification happened. Uh, and that's been very concerning to me. We've spoken out about it a lot, and I'm, I hope that uh, somehow, someday, <laughs> we, we, might, we might get uh, that authority back. Uh, we've, we've, the, the answers have touched to some degree on state rules, uh, and I was wondering to what extent you have been, have been able to or expect to be able to um, advance uh, your work through or in coordination with state legislatures and agencies? Did you remember? Nope. Okay. Oftentimes the FTC's enforcement is brought along with state, the state AGs. Uh, they can be our very good partners in a lot of enforcement actions and things like, uh, you know, privacy violations or fraud or antitrust too often. I find if we're challenging a transaction with an estate, if we have the estate AG on board, that helps us uh, win. Uh, so that so that's good. Uh, but uh, also, many states have little FTC acts, uh, and then they're parallel to the FTC's own statute. Uh, now, in some areas, I think there are concerns that having too many uh, different conflicting laws, like for example, in data breach. So a lot of states have data breach notification requirements. And the FTC has testified in Congress uh, in favor of a federal a data security and breach notification bill, with one of the benefits being to create a uniform federal standard for that. Yeah, and I'll say in one area for us that, that we've already talked briefly about is on the, the infrastructure deployment side. Congress has given the FCC some pretty specific authority in, in 332 and 253. But at the same time, Congress has recognized, you know, rightfully as a policy matter and as a matter of law, that states play an important role here as well. And so I think when we look at this, we look at trying to move forward in partnership, which is we'll stick with the authority that Congress gave us to help streamline. We'll also look where can we partner with state and localities so that on their end, they're also updating their laws to streamline deployment. We have an advisory committee at the commission right now where we have representatives from the industry and from state and local governments as well we're looking to work together to promote the same goal, uh, which is greater wireless deployment. Um, well, let me see. Uh, I think I've covered the most of it. Maybe you uh, can move into the next phase after each of you give some sort of roundup, whatever you, whatever you really want to communicate to the group. One of the things I'd like to, c to communicate uh, to the group is that you know the FTC's role uh, has been not to be an industry-specific regulator, but to be a general enforcer of the competition laws and the consumer protection laws in the U.S. Uh, and I think that we have a lot of expertise to bring to bear in this area, particularly as markets are changing. We see a lot of changes, a lot of convergence in communications markets. Uh, and the FTC, I think, can bring a lot of expertise to that and help, uh, you know, between our competition uh, expertise and consumer protection expertise. So I'll just 
uh, point back to, you know, net neutrality obviously is a very hot topic. We've long been paying attention to it. And so I, in a previous role at the FTC, headed up our Internet Access Task Force. And we did a unanimous bipartisan report in 2007 that looked at net neutrality issues and said, you know, could there possibly be bottlenecks here that sometimes cause problems? We said, yes. But there also could be a lot of uh, pro-competitive or competitively neutral uh, vertical arrangements here. So the normal course you would take to look at this would be uh, a rule of reason approach, and you would just bring an, an action if there, if there was a problem, and we outline the kinds of tools that the FTC can bring to bear. And I think that report holds up extremely well 10 years later. Uh, those markets have moved towards more competition. I actually testified in front of Congress on this recently. So just to, you know, kind of encourage people as we're thinking about these markets, these topics, to get a, a good understanding of what expertise and tools the FTC can bring. You also really echo that on, on net neutrality. I think the, the expertise that the Federal Trade Commission can bring is something that uh, shouldn't be underestimated. I think as, as uh, the acting chair mentioned in 2015, the FCC reclassified the Internet under what we call Title II, which is our common carriage, heavy-handed, preemptive regulatory framework, to put it neutrally. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, tell us how you really think that, right? <laughs> And really, essentially, you know, stole the lunch money from the FTC. You know, the FTC was a cop on the beat. There were standards that were in place, and the FTC is an agency that can look, unlike the FCC, across the entire Internet, internet ecosystem. If there's an issue with privacy, whether it's at the edge of the network, uh, on an edge provider, or with ISPs, the FTC would, save for Title II, have the jurisdiction and importantly the expertise to look at those issues and ensure that consumers are being protected, to ensure uh, that competition is being preserved. So the extent that we at the FCC reverse Title II, I'm very confident that we'll be back in a situation uh, where the FTC is the cop back on the beat and it can take care of any issues that arise. And if you remember as well, before 2015, when the FCC classified the Internet under Title II, we weren't living in an area, era where we were seeing you know, the fragmentation of the Internet or consumer harms. I mean, the Internet has been the greatest free market success story that we've ever seen since privatization of it. And I think it's not, in my view, the poster child for monopoly era regulations. We want to spur competition. And when you look at Title II, uh, a lot of the focus in D.C. and in regulation is on the big companies, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast. I understand that. I get why. But if you get outside of D.C., if you want additional competition, there's thousands of smaller broadband providers out there. They're not like AT&T. They're not like Comcast. They don't have armies of regulatory lawyers. Uh, there's been evidence of a negative investment impact on those largest providers from Title II. But if you look beyond that as well, the smaller providers have filed declarations under penalty of perjury saying we've specifically pulled back investment because of the Title II decision that the FCC made. So I'm hopeful that that's one that we will soon take up. Let me ask a, uh, one question that, that is spurred by what you both said, and that is can, can you imagine uh, this Congress, let's put it that way, this Congress adopting uh, telecommunications legislation uh, that would, uh, in your view, be sound and resolve uh, ambiguities that stand in the way of uh, a sort of long-term, what to never say permanent, but a relatively long-term uh, resolution of these issues. So I testified in front of Congress about two weeks ago on net neutrality, and uh, I did find some interest uh, among members of Congress in, in trying to figure out, is there a legislative way to approach, to approach this? Uh, is there a way to get to some sort of legislative certainty uh, because of concerns about if, you know, one administration is in and they come up with one set of rules and then another administration is in and they have another set of rules, you know, that, that kind of swing back and forth isn't really great for, for investment or, or certainty. Uh, but I also think that there was a, a good understanding, a good discussion about the fact that we need to allow these markets to evolve, right? With the idea that we're going to freeze them into place and what they looked like in you know, 2015 doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So whatever uh, approach they would take, I would want them to understand that uh, allowing vertical integration, allowing new forms of delivery, allowing you know, content uh, prioritization, if that's what consumers want, is 
you know, something that sh that the law should contemplate, and, and then just focus on where harms might might arise. And I think that's why antitrust and consumer protection kind of comes to mind as a system that allows changes to happen, benefits to uh, to occur, uh, but then focuses on when there's a, a, a harm to competition. That's where you should take action. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I'll echo uh, similar thoughts. I think uh, I'd welcome Congress stepping in with specific legislation that addresses this. If you look through the court decisions that we've seen, whether it's the Supreme Court in Brand X uh, or the D.C. Circuit more recently, the uh, Supreme Court in Brand X deferred to the FCC's decision that it was a Title I service, the, uh, the D.C. Circuit recently that on the, the Title II side. So if you look at the common thread with, between all these, these are what we call in the legal realm Chevron Step 2 cases, which is the courts at least have reached the decision that Congress has not spoken directly to this issue. And when you think about it, you know, internet regulation should not be a Chevron step two case. When it comes to something as fundamental as how we're going to regulate in the internet, you know, this is something that in my mind uh, people should reach as a Chevron step one. Now putting aside my own views about how clear the statute is on it, it's at least the courts have said that Congress in their minds hasn't been cleared here. Uh, so I do think that it would be welcome for Congress to step in. Thank you. I, th I think we're ready to move on to the broader panel. Uh, so if the additional, Thanks. but I would uh, like the audience to thank the two commissioners. Oh, I see. There's another, there's another chair there. Should we move that way here? What's, what's the uh, geographic plan? We all move that way? Um, no. So you can stay right there. Okay, okay. All right. I didn't frame it yet. <laughs> I uh, love it. An exhort exhortation. That one was good. <laughs> Jonathan, hello. And let's see. So yes, we're moving, we're moving clockwise. It's gonna be John, Rod, me, and then John. Yeah. I'm sure by the time we get to you. <laughs> I'm sure by the time we get to me, I'll, I won't rem know Remember. what to say. Okay. Okay, we'll do. Sure. No, and I've got a big mouth. You'll hear me. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I heard that. You heard that, right? Exactly. <laughs> but it's but a beautiful mouth. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Go through them, I'll just put them up there. 
I thought, I thought we were talking about what we did on our summer vacation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of forgot about Is that. Is that correct? <laughs> you all know each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to come see you. I, I and likewise. I know. There's a, there's a whole uh, species of human beings that live in Washington where they only see each other on panels. That's, right. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Like, <laughs> it's, it's the panel circuit. Yeah. Oh, it was. Uh, Three to five minutes. Right. So. Three to five minutes? Three to five minutes. Maybe they have questions. I don't know. <laughs> we didn't have any. We ended up not having room for questions really audience like part yeah. questions to the yeah, commissioners. The commissioners. I, I guess I didn't take it on board the fact that the commissioners were going to disappear. Yeah, right. <laughs> that would have been interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that would have been interesting. <laughs> I would actually sit there and watch that. We're going to move into the second phase, uh, and we have uh, four distinguished experts who will each speak for three to five minutes. Then we have sort of a free-for-all. It can be uh, them responding to each other's statements, uh, and, uh, and then uh, questions from the audience. So, um, and I'm going to uh, give some of these people are so distinguished, they're very long uh, <laughs> bios, but I'll, I'll try to do, do a fair job. Um, Jonathan Spoller, who's our, our first speaker, is president and CEO of U.S. Telecom, I have to say, an entity that I've seen much of. Uh, graduated from Harvard, magna with the BA, before getting a master's in international relations from the University of Cambridge. Served as CEO for a number of companies, including Snowcap at Media Worldwide and Vendi Universal. He served as Executive Vice President for Business Development and Strategy at Vendi Net. Prior to joining U.S. Telecom, served as Chair of Mobile Future, and he's been a policy aide to the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy at the Pentagon, uh, and he's also been. Associate Director of the U.S. Information Agency. Uh, and finally, as I think it's fine, yeah, Director uh, on the National Security Council and Vice President Gore's Chief International Affairs Spokesman and Speechwriter. Um. Well, thank you very much, Judge Williams, and uh, I am very grateful to you to be speaking on a panel with you as opposed to speaking in your courtroom. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course to the Federal Society, I'm very, very, very honored to be uh, at your table. Um, and to my co-panelists, very nice to see you all. Uh, I, I was just reflecting that the last time, uh, as Brendan Carr reflected on thinking about whether there was a statutory opportunity to encode in legislative language, uh, regulatory framework for our internet. The last time that was done was in 1996, 21 years ago. 21 years, birthday is usually something you celebrate in regulatory years, it's a long, long time. But I was just, before getting into the substance, I was just thinking about how far we've come in the evolution of this thing we call the internet, this phenomenon. 21 years ago, in 1996, if you were bored, you would fire up your desktop, um, hear that screech and honk of your AOL, wait 20 seconds for your homepage to come on, you would be minding it carefully because you were paying for your internet by the hour. And when it did come up, you might have a few choices. There were very limited websites among the 20 million of you who were actually online at the time, which is about the number of people that we have uh, subscribing to satellite radio today. You, you have choices like sites like Suck, Hotwired, there was Slate and Salon and Wall Street Journal was there, but names like Google and Facebook and Snapchat uh, were figments of the imagination. 
Um, we've come a profoundly long way since then. Even if you just look at the market capitalization of public companies, not to mention the hundreds of private companies that comprise what we call the internet in the United States, the market cap exceeds $3 trillion. It represents, according to recent statistics by economists, around 6% of our economy. We're transiting, as Brendan Carr mentioned, to the, the still unimaginable phenomenon of, of 5G network evolution, which will allow our speeds to increase 100 times density of networks, which will support about 2 million wireless sensors in a square mile. It really is incomparable to think about the progress that we've seen just in the last 21 years. And a lot of it, I think, was due to the bipartisan regulatory paradigm that was elaborated at the time. It was bipartisan, uh, it was light touch, it took a view that the role of the proper regulatory paradigm for incenting this opportunity of growth was through a light touch, humble approach that would not supersede government fiat but to the more important uh, goals and values and principles of eliciting and catalyzing more innovation and investment. And that really did inform this extraordinary hockey stick of growth and opportunity and jobs and economic productivity that we've seen as a result uh, until a couple of years ago in 2015 when the FCC upended this long-standing and very successful approach by shoehorning broadband, which is the technology that is the connective tissue joining so many facets of our modern economic, political, and cultural life and civil society into the narrow band voice world of common carrier or Title II regulation, vastly expanding the FCC's bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic authority over this important sector called the broadband world. And there have been bad, bad signs as a result. Uh, Commissioner Carr mentioned one of them. We've seen a, a regression in CapEx and investment in our networks, uh, which has been on a healthy slope over the last couple of decades. It went from about $78 billion down to $76 billion just in the last couple of years. This does not augur well for the future. Um, we see this in the context of, of the imposition of Title II, which vastly expanded the authorities and prerogatives arrogated to the FCC, I would suggest, arrogantly. Uh, we appealed that decision at U.S. Telecom. Um, a panel of the D.C. Circuit rejected our appeal with Judge Williams concurring in part and dissenting in part. We appreciate the dissents. <laughs> um, our petition uh, for a rehearing on Bonk was rejected, despite very strong and thoughtful dissents from Judges Rogers and Kavanaugh. We filed for the Supreme Court to review. Uh, the government's response has not yet been filed. And I'd just like to spend a moment, one minute, just offering the nub of our argument that our petition to the Supreme Court laid out. And it's rather simple. Um, there are lots of other arguments that are much, much more technical, detailed, and procedural. But overall, what we argue, to quote our petition, and it reflects what Commissioner Carr also shared with you, um, is that, quote, no deference is warranted to the administrative state shoehorning major questions into the long extant statutory provisions without congressional authorization. And what better defines, what is the poster child, to use that phrase again, a major question than something as expansive, as deeply embedded into our current economic and cultural life than what we call the internet. I'll pause there because my time is up, but I, I look forward to expanding and thinking this through with the I'm sure the we'll get back to those things. Um, the, the next speaker is Roslyn Layden. PhD fellow uh, for the Center for Communication, Media, and Information Studies at Aalborg. Is that the correct answer? Yes. She is currently a visiting scholar at AEI and vice president of Strand Consult, a company based in Denmark. She earned her BA in international service and graduated cum laude in economics. She's received her MBA from UNC Kenan Flagler Business School and from Rotterdam School of Management. Uh, Erasmus, Erasmus University in International Business. Uh, and in, 
this year. She'll receive her PhD from Albert in business economics. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, as you can see, I've capitulated to put up some uh, PowerPoint slides, but I uh, wanted to make a comparison uh, of U.S. and E.U., uh, where are the status for these two regions. And uh, before I begin, let me just say thank you again to the Federalist Society for this invitation. Congratulations on 35 tremendous years. It's such an honor to be with these esteemed colleagues, and certainly you, Justice Williams, so thank you. Uh, it's interesting to take a, a, a global view. Uh, that's the work that I do in, in my field where um, instead of sort of saying, well, let's try out some policy, we think this is the way to go, we can actually study uh, regions around the world. What are they doing? Is it working? So I want to give you a view of uh, the European Union, which has had uh, uh, for over a year an implementation of their net neutrality law. Uh, it came into effect in 2015, and this uh, past summer, the 29, uh, 28 nations of the European Union plus Norway submitted reports of uh, a status report of what is going on in their implementation. So it's interesting to review these two different approaches. As you know, in the United States, we have an administrative approach taken from the FCC with bright line rules. The EU adopted on quite a, you might call, multipartisan basis um, what was seen as a very popular law, in fact. So um, the components of the EU law um, there, it's essentially based upon equal treatment of traffic, uh, except in the very strict situations that were legal requirements, network security, and con congestion, which is only allowed to be, is only acceptable on a temporary basis. Uh, traffic management, this is quite a um, detailed, complex area, but it's sort of believed that um, if you manage your network somehow for efficiency, that's not a good thing. You should just build a lot of capacity um, and have a lot of you know, big pipes with you know, a, a data flowing through, which is also an economic choice. And finally, really the heart of the European rules are around speed disclosures. Uh, this has a lot to do with uh, very ex detailed requirements around how you disclose the speeds of networks, a certain set of requirements on fixed mo networks and then also on mobile networks. Now many of the EU countries had a number of these speed disclosure rules in place, but the EU is attempting to harmonize those disclosures so there can be a European standard. So not surprisingly, there's a lot of uh, litigation, not just in the US, but in the EU, uh, there are seven petitions now uh, in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, Jonathan, has, um, he described what's going on from his group with the U.S. Telecom. There are five petitions from industry, and there are two, one petition from the think tank Tech Freedom and another from an engineer, a co-founder of Voice Over Internet Protocol. And so, as one can understand, appreciate a conference like this, a lot of questions around administrative law and the separation of powers. What's uh, extremely interesting is the First Amendment claims against this policy. There's a great article today in American Enterprise Institute, my colleague Gus Hurwitz, who's summarizing these perspectives, um, the, looking at uh, the First Amendment uh, challenges that the open internet order creates. It's quite significant when you look at uh, a person like Dan Berninger, who um, his app, uh, Hello Digital, which puts high definition voice behind um, social media comments, he cannot deploy his app because he cannot buy prioritization for his signals. So literally, the users of his app cannot speak. So uh, I think he has a strong First Amendment uh, 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 defense in the brilliant dissent and oral, oral arguments with Justice Williams. He described this as um, refrigerated boxcars, uh, that if you have cargo on a train, some cargo may need to be refrigerated, maybe some needs to be insulated. It's utterly reasonable, to use the judge's words, that some uh, data will can purchase this kind of treatment. Uh, we have also the major questions doctrine, I think as Brendan Carr alluded to in the last panel. Is this issue about whether we regulate the internet, is that something that Congress said the FCC can decide? Uh, is um, do, and, and so there's a question there. This is what tech freedom is raising. Is it a major question? And in fact, it's, not, it's certainly not uh, evident in the statute that the FCC can decide to regulate one-sixth of the economy. So those are the questions that turn on Chevron. Similarly, in administrative law questions in the European Union, yesterday Mr. Calabresi spoke about the role of the administrative courts in the EU. 
And if you have, if you look at the FCC, which is itself the uh, an adjudicator, uh, the executor, and the um, you know the legislator of its rules, there could be a value to have an administrative court. And so Mr. Calabresi called for that. But in the EU, all these rules have been brought up in administrative courts in a number of countries, and they. Um, uh, have similar questions because you've had pre-existing net neutrality rules in Netherlands and Slovenia. Now there's a EU-wide rule, so there are questions around how you deliver that. Um, and also, uh, uh, so, so that's a big part of it. The, a lot of the um, uh, complaints have been about zero rating and uh, this whole belief that if you treat all traffic the same, it is a, um, uh, you must all price it all the same. And that is, uh, th those two cases have been, two cases in the European Union have proven that you cannot interpret net neutrality as a ban on price discrimination, that in fact data can be priced differently. I think this is the essential link to the First Amendment, because if you price all traffic the same, essentially you force the end user to value all content the same, and people don't, they value content differently. So um, uh, the two cases there in uh, uh, the Netherlands and Slovenia, and in fact, in Sweden, the court found that what people call zero rating is harmful. They said, in fact, if you make data for free, you actually expand human rights. So this is uh, the opposite of what a number of regulators want. And uh, um, just to know there are some ongoing challenges here um, in the EU. We're gonna see more litigation, not less. And uh, also, I think I predict privacy concerns because the European regulators are adopting such invasive techniques to monitor the networks, to see that operators are complying, that they are effectively violating the privacy of end users. And of course, we have challenges with um, bureaucracy. I will close now, I know I'm out of time, but uh, I wanna point out there, I have this in a new report um, from Strand Consult, which you can get. And uh, also to thank the Federal Society that just published a new paper I've written with uh, Tom Struble of R Street Institute, looking at how the FTC is eminently capable of uh, policing net neutrality, and we'd certainly see this looking at the various approaches taken abroad. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Nicole, Nicole Turner-Lee, a fellow uh, at the Center for Technology Innovation and a contributor to Tech Tank at Brookings. She graduated uh, magna from Colgate University and earned an MA and PhD in sociology from Northwestern. She also received a certificate of nonprofit management from the University of Chicago, Illinois. She's been vice president and first director of the Media and Technology Institute at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Uh, she's a visiting scholar at Arizona State University for their Center for Gender Equity in Science and Technology, uh, and she's been on the U.S. State Department's Advisory Committee uh, on International Communications and Inf Information Policy, and also is the author of several works, including Place Matters, The Debate Over Broadband Availability, uh, A Lifeline, uh, comma, new, new, <laughs> new title, A Lifetime to High Speed Internet Access, an economic analysis of administrative costs and the impact on consumers, and I'll let her speak for herself after that. Thank you, Justice, and I'm actually glad you read my bio full because I'm not in court in front of you. <laughs> 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 so that'll probably be the last time that that actually gets read <laughs> by a, a Justice, so thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to the Federal Society. I want to say thank you to my <laughs> colleagues for actually engaging me in this conversation. Um, and just sort of say thank you to myself for being a person who was part of this net neutrality discussion for many years um, at the Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council, who is now a researcher who gets to say whatever I want to say. Um, and also, as a non-lawyer, I can actually shed some light, much like uh, Rosalind's great presentation. So I want to actually just devote my comments to something that sort of put an aha light on for me, which the um, commissioners both discussed and the acting chairwoman both discussed in the prior panel uh, for why this needs to go to congressional solution. Um, as I'm seated here next to my friend John Salad, who will speak next, you know, as a person who has watched this debate um, since the original order, you know, dating back to 2010 to 2015, et cetera, what we're actually seeing is this um, evolving nature of, of internet regulation that I think, think has taken several stages and several steps, right? 
Um, in the beginning, when it was first introduced by Tim Wu, we were looking at a First Amendment, first um, open internet as it related to um, people being able to place content free of discriminatory um, practice. And that was a First Amendment concern, which even today, there are little spruces of it that show up, uh, particularly on the Democratic side when it comes to talking about this debate. That debate over time, particularly with the reclassification of uh, broadband service providers under Title II, has morphed into a jurisdictional question. And I think this is the most fascinating part of this debate, that what started out as, will we have an internet that is free from controls that limit the availability and the dissemination of content has turned into a conversation of who has regulatory authority over who manages and who controls the internet. And what I would argue as I close my couple of minutes in the next few minutes is that we are no longer talking um, as strongly around just net neutrality principles as it was mentioned by both commissioners. We're talking about infrastructure. For those of you who are watching, we're talking about the evolution of artificial intelligence, machines. We're talking about broadband availability in terms of digital inclusion. And these issues have different responsibilities by both agencies and all of us to look at accordingly and, and spending most of our time battling over who has the net, which has morphed into something that didn't look like it did in 2010, I find to be very interesting, right? Because we're still sort of locked in time in this discussion. But I think Congress has an opportunity, and I, and I was sharing with one of my friends um, over at AEI, uh, that it would appear to me with all the comments that flooded the FCC that co Congress really should not be in a place of picking winners or losers. They should be looking at these comments as an indicator that perhaps they need to come in and talk to each other. That this has taken a lot more when you have millions of comments flood through a very small agency by far in, compar in comparison, that perhaps there's some action that needs to be done. And if you watch the news like I do, I mean, even um, Senator Franken just the other day sort of reversed course on what he thought last year, which tells you how confusing this debate continues to be. So with that said, people have asked me, well, Nicole, what do you think a congressional solution should look like? I'm in total agreement, um, particularly looking at the original basis of the last order that was enforced around the Bright Line principles. I think we saw overwhelming support for the things that Roslyn just placed on the board. No uh, paid prioritization, no discrimination, um, no throttling, general transparency. I think the only debatable clause is the one around internet conduct standard, where uh, there's been some debate, given the internet conduct standard, particularly relating to the case of zero rating, where you now see that to be a profitable uh, pathway to entry, particularly for low-income consumers who I study, by having that data available. Under the current uh, order, it is one of those areas which can be ruled as a net neutrality violation. So I think you really have to look at that carefully, particularly when you're looking at the provision of telemedicine and telehealth and other public interest applications. Will that stifle innovation in that area? But I also think to get to bipartisan support, which is where we're actually lacking, you have to put something in around consumer protection. And that's a debatable bright line that I think you know, may not necessarily be a catch-all. But there is some responsibility, I think, on both parts to actually have that conversation. Um, Henry Waxman in 2010 actually put out a proposal that uh, revoked Title II, opened up the dialogue, and I think came close to trying to get to some bipartisan agreement led by a Democrat that we could actually do this without the strongest of regulatory, over, regulatory overreach. Um, the challenge has been that the Republicans have come back and basically tried to wipe out authority of everybody else, push away the consumer protection. And I have to tell you, um, that's what the Democrats are looking for when it comes to any type of congressional support moving forward. Um, and that's what the consumer advocates on the side of support of holding on to these rules are looking for. So I think Justice and all the panelists, there's conversation for that, right? What would another bright line look like? Is there some kind of... Um, uh, I don't want to say catch-all, but some type of mechanism to trigger a consumer protection. Are there other ways to do that? I think we're getting closer when it comes to congressional solution around the um, nature of, of codependence of the FTC and the FCC in the regulatory oversight of this issue. And I think, again, that's something that Congress can work out. Part of the challenges with the last Thune bill and the last uh, bill that came out of Lee's office was that they wanted to wipe out the jurisdiction of the FCC, which really doesn't have precedence to be able to do that immediately. Um, I want to close by saying why I'm so passionate about this. The telecommunications aspect of the House Energy and Commerce Com uh, Committee have always been bipartisan. 
that has led to great advancements in spectrum policy. It has reinvested and changed the nature of media ownership rules. Why we can't get to bipartisan agreement on this, I am still baffled because I think there has been the nature of conversation. Obviously, it's because of the political climate. But moving forward, just as I close, it appears to me that the only way we will get resolution outside of the courts is to do such. Um, and if we stay in this space, we'll continue to not put a period on this and put a holding uh, legacy of periods on other issues that we should be worrying about at the FCC. Thank you. And the last speaker is Jonathan Sallett. It's, it's hard to introduce Jonathan because I've known him for so many years. <laughs> right. Although, yes, although I, don't, I did, didn't know everything that's in this. <laughs> oh, well, uh, how long does it go back? Yeah. I mean, don't at least read a decade, it. surely. <laughs> yes, probably, exactly. Probably a decade, for anyway, sure. Anyway, um, and, uh, and incidentally, I, I think I think my citation to your earlier, yes. what was the title of it? Uh, the Broadband Value Circle. Mm -hmm. The Broadband Value Circle, uh, which seemed to me to be in tension with some of the arguments that Jonathan was making before it, us. It, it also has another distinction, Judge Williams. It's the only time the article has been cited. <laughs> <laughs> so for this I'm time, I, I am extremely appreciative. I've cited your article. I've cited your article. <laughs> In a judicial opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, I hope you'll find occasion to cite my recently published book. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he is a visiting uh, fellow in the Center for Governance Studies at Brookings uh, and a partner in Steptoe and Johnson, uh, provides litigation strategies and legal counsel for antitrust, communications law, and other competition policies. Uh, and uh, along with his private practice, he's worked inside the federal government as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division, General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission, and he has a bachelor's from Brown and a law degree from the University of Virginia and clerked for Associate Justice Powell. Thank, thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank the Federalist Society for the chance to be here. It's important to have a place where ideas are taken seriously and discussed on their merits. There aren't that many places where such discussions are held, and I appreciate the chance to be here because that is a tradition of the Federalist Society. I appreciate the chance to be here with, of course, Commissioner Allhouse and Commissioner Carr, my panelists, and I especially appreciate the chance to again answer questions about net neutrality from Judge Williams. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about the law for a second. When I was a law clerk, the, an admonition that we all were told was that the starting point of statutory construction starts with the statute itself. So in 1996, Congress changed the law. It's important to note, this was not in 1934, that day of regulated monopolies. This was 1996. New statutory definitions at a moment when Congress looked to a competitive sector and when Congress made the decision to apply these definitions to everybody who qualified, unlike other provisions which it said should only apply to incumbents. And the purpose of these definitions comes from the MFJ with the breakup of AT&T. It comes from the Computer Two inquiries. And the purpose was very straightforward. Congress wanted to make sure that, la that the networks that went directly to people's homes, or mobile, I think, but let's just say fixed, networks that went to people's home could not act as gatekeepers, influencing the c competition in the adjacent markets for the delivery of content. And so it created two definitions. One, information services, that which is the kind of content that websites deliver, apps deliver. And then there's telecommunications. What's telecommunications? It is the transmission between or among points specified by the user of information of the user's choosing without change in the form or content of the information. That's what broadband companies do. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's what the statute says. It's what the law, in effect, requires. And it is clear, this is the strength of, I think, Justice Scalia's dissent in Brand X, is he makes plain, this is the definitions, it serves the purpose, and what a broadband company does, 
quite clearly qualifies because a broadband company transmits data. That's what consumers want, that's what they expect. If I go onto Netflix and I order <coughs> Laurence Olivier and King Lear, I would be sad if it showed up with a happy ending. <laughs> I expect the movie I ordered to come over the broadband connections and come to me without change in form or content. And this, this is why Congress, indeed society, treats these networks as different than other things. Why does the Copyright Act say that there's no liability for broadband networks? Because they are recognized to be conduits that are being used for the passage of material. Why in all of the recent discussion of fake news or ads, I don't mean fake news, but the ads from Russia, are people concerned about certain platforms on which the ads are placed, but nobody is criticizing the broadband networks? Because nobody thinks the broadband networks are making editorial decisions about the transmission of those ads. It is transmission, it's pure, it's simple, and it's statutory. So, the notion that Title II applies is a notion, I believe, that comes inexorably from the statute itself. Now, one other point, and then we'll perhaps have a longer conversation. <laughs> the question of harm, is there harm? Is there anything to worry about? We need to understand a couple of things about broadband companies. First, there has been a consistent policy since 2005 that the FCC would take action to keep the open internet open. The jurisdictional bases have changed over time, but the commitment to that outcome has been unchanged under Republicans and Democrats. And so to say that there's relatively few instances of harm is to say, why do few people jaywalk right in front of a policeman? There's been a policeman on the beat for 10 years saying, don't do this, and then they don't, not much happens, and people say, well, didn't need the policeman. No, the policeman was on the beat, and that's the best and simplest explanation for behavior. But if that weren't enough, we have a series of merger reviews conducted by the Department of Justice and the FCC, starting with Comcast NBC, with both agencies look at the anti-competitive harm that can arise when broadband companies through vertical arrangements have both the incentive and the ability to harm competition in related markets. And in a series of these cases, perhaps we'll talk about them more later, both agencies have found that such incentive and ability exists, and that's not all. In the proceeding underway now, the New York Attorney General's office filed a pleading talking about two investigations it conducted that found, in fact, there was degradation in interconnection. So, in fact, we have the economic analysis, we have the factual analysis to demonstrate incentive and ability to cause harm through vertical arrangements that favor, one would say, I think fairly, vertically integrated entities that combine broadband and video. So we'll come back to more later. I won't, thank you, I won't, I won't take more time on this now, except to say there's a lot to discuss here and there are important policy questions, but I really believe that the law and the economics and the evidence supports the, the, the use of Title II under the terms as Congress has enacted it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when I agreed to moderate this panel, I had no idea that it was going to be a replay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my role is distinctly different. Uh, there, I, I was a judge, and it was my job to grill lawyers uh, to find out what uh, uh, lay behind their presentations and how their presentations uh, lined up with other things that I'm familiar with. Here, I am a moderator. <laughs> let, me, let me start by um, asking the panelists if, if there are any things that um, the commissioner said in the first half hour that they think they want to 
endorse, refute, qualify, comment on. Yes. So I want to uh, echo uh, Chair, uh, Chairman Olhausen's comments on consumer protection and also come back to Nicole's point, you know, this, um, this idea that we need additional consumer protections. I, uh, I also want to point you again to my new paper with, uh, with FedSoc where I, I go into this. But the, um, what's important with the, F, with the FTC Act, of Section 5, Unfair and Deceptive Practices, in my view, is actually broader than the FCC authority to uh, discover uh, possible harms to consumers. And if you look under an FTC world, you actually have a layered model of enforcement that the FCC doesn't have. So this is why you see state attorney generals um, using or and also consumer protection authority some state consumer protection level laws to police broadband contracts uh, i think it's quite notable that it was the ftc that brought this case against at&t mobility claims around their unlimited uh, service that was somehow throttling and, and degradation later on the fcc brought the same case calling it net neutrality i think that's quite a duplicative wasteful effort and ultimately the fcc gave that up and it's still going now in, in the court. But it, you can certainly see that there are state AGs who have already been off to the races in terms of policing consumer protection very aggressively. And you could say in some instances, if you know it's the state of New York and there's abuse going on, the state of New York's attorney general can address it. So there's not a concern that there's somehow, uh, that, that, that our existing rules are not first of all, don't work for net neutrality and aren't up to the task to police uh, uh, any harms of consumer protection. I think they're eminently capable. Other? Can I just say one word? Uh, Commissioner Ohals and Commissioner Carr both talked about the importance of economics, and I just want to say that is exactly right. I mean, it, of course, it's obvious because the, particularly the FTC's Bureau of Economics has been so strong and so important for, for so long, but I just think in any inquiry, starting off by asking economists what are theories of harm, candidate theories of harm, they may or may not prove out, is an extraordinarily important way to proceed. I will say when at the FCC we did the Comcast Time Warner merger review, it was that work that revealed to us the questions that when evidence was gathered, led to the staff view that there were anti-competitive issues that couldn't otherwise be dealt with. Um, and so having the economists, I think, always involved, but particularly I thought creating the blueprint for inquiry, uh, I think is very important, and I, I agree with the commissioners on this. Any other responses? in the domain that I opened through. I, I wouldn't mind with your permission to pivot from commenting on the commissioner's comments to Jonathan's comments. <laughs> well, let me say something first. <laughs> okay, we have one more on, on, the, on the question. On the broad subject that I introduced. Well, I, I actually, I mean, I want to echo what Rosalind said, but also I think both commissioners and I follow their work very closely. I think the thing that I gleaned from that too, Justice, is the fact that they're forward-thinking comments, right? I mean, the issue of net neutrality, as I shared, was sort of, sort of seen in a vacuum, and the conversations around infrastructure, you know, uh, the FTC not having the ability because of the imposition of the rules to sort of take them out of the equation to not look at, you know, what happens, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, get ahead of Jonathan's falter for Jonathan Salad. But, you know, there is this... You, you, you both can do it. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I'm going to let him do it first, and I'm just going to sit back. But, <laughs> but there is this concern, I think, of consumers when you look at the on and off button. You know, when, do, when is it that my... Um, broadband service provider is the um, reason for some kind of disruption of service versus my app, you know. And I think that, you know, this, this world that we live in now, the echo chambers that were clearly defined then do no longer exist. There is a codependency that now exists between these verticals that are much different than when this dialogue opened up years ago. Um, and I think that's something that I did glean. You know, you look at infrastructure, and I know uh, U.S. Telecom just came out with a report which, in which I cited. You know, there is reasonable concern when you look at ways that um, uh, reclassification affects investment. And for the communities in which I speak to, 
you know, they are on the last of the list when it comes to investment as well as rural. So we should be concerned right. when we are trying to put together an, a very aggressive infrastructure plan that makes sure we deliver ubiquitous broadband to all communities. Um, and so I think, again, what I was uh, really taken by is the conversation where the commissioners are trying to move this goes way beyond the scope of this one regulatory concern, uh, which is why I think we still need to move towards a solution. Sure. And, and, and if I may, just to echo a bit of what Roz said, but also what the commissioners reflected, and Commissioner Allhouse in particular, that the, the FTC through Section 5 does have a broad and holistic perspective on this increasingly converging thing we call the internet, an ecosystem that we know is transcending the traditional regulatory taxonomies that have siloed so uh, different aspects of the internet into these administrative or regulatory buckets that no longer are relevant. And I think that the we know in terms of theories of harm that it's not just the FTC, but it's the Department of Justice. Um, it is class action efforts through our courts. It is also state attorney generals with broader codes of, of consumer uh, conduct and consumer protection that offer important and material backstops to protect consumers against apparent harm. But Jonathan, in the theory of harm uh, concept, I'm really glad you, re you, you mentioned Netflix and um, also did trying I? to download did King you, Lear. You did. You did. did I mention Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> not not it, to, to get to King Lear. Because it was, yeah. in oh, fact, in Act Amazon, 1, I'm sorry. scene 4. <laughs> I thought I said Amazon. I thought I said Amazon. Or Amazon or whatever was over the top streaming that service. That's that's where that's where where <laughs> which, by the way, is now a fundamental part of our broadening broadband right. ecosystem and should be considered as such. Um, but Act 1, scene 4 of King Lear, uh, Duke of Albany, is well known to have said, striving to do better, we, we uh, we oft mar what is well. And there's no better example of trying to fix something that's not broken than the imposition of Title II on an ecosystem that was done in 2015 um, that was uh, and hopefully will remain an expanding, vibrant ecosystem that's striving for more abundance and less regulation. And if regulation is due, it should be to Congress that uh, we turn to assign to the appropriate regulatory agency to make those determinations. And in absence of that determination yet by Congress, by statute, uh, we really do need to return to a status quo ante, a regulatory paradigm that we knew when we worked on these issues in 1996, coalesced around this concept of a bipartisan light touch approach, which in section 230B2 very specifically said uh, that the meaning of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was to preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists for the internet unfettered by federal or state regulation. Could I have just a word? <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> so, history can get blurred sometimes. The, the history is the Title II was applied to what we think of in, as internet access, and it was applied to cellular networks at a time of tremendous growth, right? The 1992 Act put a Title II, limited number of sections, one should say, on cellular, and the resulting decade was the huge growth in cellular as a Title II service. <coughs> Dial-up access at the time of the 96 Act, Title II service. The first broadband that came to people's homes, DSL, Title II service. All of this that happened in the 1990s was happening at a time when these were Title II services. They didn't stop innovation. They didn't stop investment. And it seems to me, with all due respect, that the case hasn't been made if, if, it, if it were something on which the statute turned, which I don't think a reading of the language permits, that the 2015 order is the cause of changes in investment. In fact, AT&T is on the record as saying, and I think this is reasonable, investment is lumpy. Sometimes when you make investment, you don't make as much investment the next year because you've just made the investment and it has continuing effects. So I think the correlation 
is questionable and the causation, to my mind, hasn't been shown. But in any event, of course, nothing I'm saying today should be understood to assert that Congress can't act in any way it wishes. It can, and it's appropriate for people to ask Congress to act. I simply take the view that while a statute is on the books, it ought to be applied consistent with its language and its clear purpose. That question of the relationship between the types of regulation, including mm -hmm. the earlier Title II regulation, was in the record uh, before us two years ago. So do you want to make a brief reply to uh, Jonathan Salad? Uh, I, I think uh, the fundamental question is, um, it, it, it really transcends a, a strict reading of statute to a, a much core and more fundamental question. And I think it is you know, the question of the major question, which is uh, a view, and I don't think it's unwarranted, that as the, f as the internet has continued to scale, as, as it has continued to touch virtually every aspect of our civil and economic life here and abroad, and has become the fulcrum for the potential competitive success of the United States economically going forward, that the wiser course of action is to build a political consensus and a dynamic that will allow Congress to turn to the fundamental question of what, uh, in statute, uh, what regulatory framework should be applied and by what agency or agencies of government should be responsible for it. In absence of that specific uh, assignation or designation by the Congress, I think it was unwarranted and uh, untimely um, and regrettable that the FCC at the 11th hour decided to relegate to itself those prerogatives. I hope as well, Jonathan, um, that eventually our Congress will uh, see wisdom uh, to and, and political consensus to address this issue. It's well overdue. I hope when it does so, it can do so in a spirit of bipartisanship, in a spirit of comedy, but also in, in a spirit of, uh, of allowing the, you know, the, the economics of abundance and technological innovation to be unfettered by state and federal regulation as it was in the 96 Act that I think gave us so many years of success. We need to get to that point. Um, I think we, we, we can and we will, and I'm optimistic that 2018 will be the year that we do so. Let me, let me just ask a question that, I mean, people allude to bipartisan activity. We normally welcome that, although mm -hmm. sometimes when I look at statutes that are uh, adopted by overwhelming votes, I <laughs> scream at the consequences of bipartisanship, but anyway, that's a different matter. Uh, but. Uh, it is the case that uh, at least one of uh, President Clinton's uh, appointees as chairman of the commission uh, was, and his name is escaping. Kennard. Kennard. Kennard, right, of course, of course. Uh, was definitely a, uh, I think was perceived as, was uniformly perceived as a light touch guy. Uh, and. So is, is, there any, uh, is there any hope of uh, bringing back the sort of, as it appeared to me, uh, bipartisan mm -hmm. view that prevailed uh, in the 90s? Me? Yeah. Anyone? I can, uh, go ahead, Ron. Well, uh, I think that there's a, well, this is something that our conference, you know, that the Federalist Society has helped uh, <coughs> talk about, you know, some of the challenges of regulation is that different industries, how they're able to use regulation to their benefit. And, you know, what is the, you know, is there bipartisanship? bipartisanship? Well, the more important question is how, what, what's at stake? How much money do you have to win or lose given certain situations? Uh, it's very interesting when you look at the European rules that the Europeans like to say, well, we're making our our question based upon human rights. We're going to transcend somehow the ordinary world of economics so we don't have to do the numbers. Well, what they've done is to say, 
these large content providers who, you know, let's say certain video entertainment, which accounts for two-thirds of the network uh, uh, data and traffic, are somehow equivalent to an end user. And it's just a human right to be able to get video entertainment. And the end, you, the end consumer has to pay the full price, regardless of the marginal cost of any particular uh, kind of content. The interesting thing is the court in Sweden said, actually, no, they rejected that view that, um, in fact, there is a freedom between the operator and the end user to find the price and to find the right arrangement. That if what you really have to understand this policy is it's an ability for one part of a, of a market to enshrine a, a particular set of conditions that favor it, uh, a, a free transit, if you will, or a reduced price or a price control, whereas another side of the market, which would be the consumers, have to pay the full cost. That is antithetical to the way that networks have evolved in America. If you think about television, um, you know, the spectrum and questions aside, in the old days you turned on the TV and the content was there because the advertisers paid for the network cost through, adver uh, through advertising. Uh, other in Europe, they said, well, we're going to have a TV license, and the uh, end users had to pay a fee to the government to be able to get content on the television. Well, there was a lot less content as a result. So um, whether there's bipartisanship is really about, are there enough business models to go around? And I think there's a great study by the Phoenix Center that says we're missing out on $30 billion a year because we're not allowing the freedom of business models. That is the amount of money that would close the digital divide. It would cl close up the rural divide because we're simply we're enshrining that there's only one business model allowed. It's called end users have to pay the whole part, the content providers get it for free. If we had a free market, both sides could find a multitude of arrangements. You'd actually have a bigger uh, market for everyone. So that's the sort of part, can we do a better job in the policy world to communicate that a free market will work better for everybody? And, and so that, I think, is a bipartisan opportunity. Right. And if I could say, I mean, one of the things that I've always said is I think the heart of many of the problems that we experience now, and as I sit between um, three folks that come out of the legal field and all of you, is that we haven't revised the Communications Act that was penned in 1934. I mean, and if you go through, I think we have done what I call a reach and grab when it comes to sort of reinterpreting the statutes as they apply today. And we've seen similar arguments uh, emerge around this debate, privacy, et cetera, that keep us somewhat in a quagmire. We haven't had a chance to do it because of other political concerns that have come up, but I chaired a committee, uh, Justice, with uh, uh, Congressman Cliff Stearns and Congressman Ed Towns, who in 96 worked together across the aisle to actually revise the Com Act then. Um, and they, in their own words, also suggested, you know, why we're not moving towards bipartisan activity when it comes to telecom, which is baffling to them. But I think last year also proved to be a very much of a watershed moment. And again, I want to keep pushing us towards, you know, what light touch regulation, and as you said under um, Bill Kennard, sort of led us. I mean, last year was net neutrality. It was also a conversation about the future of the video marketplace. It was a conversation around, you know, the changing nature of the internet when it came to the state of newspapers and media ownership. It was a conversation about spectrum scarcity because consumers are demanding more. It was a conversation about algorithms and predictive <laughs> analytics. All of that happened last year. Now we're at the tail end or middle end of a debate when we look at local, state, and federal policy when it comes to deployment and regulations in terms of poll attachments have become a new issue and how we actually bring more infrastructure to local municipalities. Those tensions are all somewhat unresolved in the current Communications Act. And we, uh, you know, and John, Jonathan, I think, Salad, I think what you're saying, you know, in terms of looking at statute, but it, as a person who takes a helicopter view of oftentimes communications policy, when I try to go back and see the reinterpretation, it brings the stickiness of unresolved. And this is an area where I think we have to push Congress to close this out so we can fuel the oxygen back into reinterpreting what this act looks like and taking out those aspects that are not as relevant. Um, we were, when I was at MMTC, we were one of the uh, uh, organizations that submitted into the docket, particularly on the side of digital inclusion and the underserved when it came to imposing Title II regulations in a space that had not had full ubiquitous deployment. Um, and our concerns around the after effects of what that would mean 
seen for communities of color that had not taken on broadband, where light touch regulation had led to prepaid cellular services and others that created an entryway into the marketplace. And so again, you know, when you go back, I tell my kids, you know, and I look at them and I laugh because my 11-year-old daughter is like, I want an iPhone for my birthday. And I'm thinking in my head, I didn't even get an iPhone for my birthday <laughs> because I had a rotary phone and we couldn't take it off the wall, right? <laughs> it's just how that worked. And you go back and you look at the generation of uh, next generation networks and where this is evolving. Again, going back and trying to continue to reinterpret applications and make those reaches may not be a, a, a relevant and substantive exercise as to where the marketplace is going. And, you know, and I don't want to pick this up, but and this should not be a conversation around political advertisements and what just recently <laughs> happened on the internet. But that's an indicator that we're probably trying to get through a breakthrough in, on issues that may no longer have the relevance in the next couple of years. I, I think it would be a good time to uh, get questions from the audience. And there's a microphone, which someone has uh, shrewdly moved to. <laughs> but a, qu a question is not a speech. <laughs> I'm glad, Your Honor, that you recognize that I have that issue, but I will get right through it. Uh, my, I was the one that was reading the system instructions in 1981. And when we wonder why the iPhone wasn't available in 1970, you can trace it back to Theodore Vail in the 20s. And, and I really appreciate Ms. Turner Lee's approach where I think she's looking at some key issues like artificial intelligence, things that are on the bleeding edge of the integration of switching and Ethernet networks over time. And I, I, I'm amazed that in California, you can put a solar dish on, you, you know, solar panels on your roof and feed into the grid of PG&E. And I'm wondering why we can't expand 5G, allowing people to put those on their houses to get into these areas. And when we talk about the bleeding edge of these industries, my question to the panel is, what do you think about the proposition that it is the end user with this little device that's actually the broadband provider of today. And that when we try to regulate the companies that are giving us the pipes, which used to have a nice analogy to water, but when the water turns smart on you, and my artificial intelligence will be able to pull content that I want when I want, and the, and, and the Title II is just a speed bump. It's an anomaly. I mean, Title I uh, could be swept away by what we're seeing in the, in the technological field. Um, could it be the case that we really need to confront the idea that the consumer is now the provider, millions and millions of us, and that that is where the government needs to adapt the incentives to bring these providers in to supply the minority community with access, to give us the artificial intelligence, and to bring us, to move us forward in this industry. Okay, responses, anyone, um, everyone? So I would like to, I, I'll try to just make it brief. I think you should look at uh, Tom Hazlett's book, The Political Spectrum. I think it's a brilliant account of the last 90 years of uh, our communications policy where consistently regulation has deterred innovation. Uh, we have the, um, uh, you know, the, ca the capability of ca cable was available since the 1940s. The FCC pushed it away for 30 years. Spectrum auctions proposed in the 1950s. The FCC didn't get around to it until the 90s. So you're absolutely right. When we come to this open internet policy, what I believe it is, is, is in a way to enshrine a particular kind of technology and a particular kind of governance, not in what ordinary consumers, I don't think people would care. If you could say you can get broadband from a milk carton, fine. They don't care. They're neutral about the kind of network. But there is a sort of political interest to have certain kind of networks under certain kind of governance and that is what this particular policy is looking to do. If I may, and I, I don't want to sound flip, but I think if every American citizen or every global citizen became, uh, in a sense, a broadband provider through a device like this, they would be instantly jarred by the extraordinary depths and details of the regulatory thickets that would have to machete through every day, the overhang burdens of compliance, the costs that are associated with that. And the concept that they would be 
uh, assigned a, having the definition of being a public utility, which is what is effectively done in Title II, would it be something that they would quickly object to? I've met many, many internet users over the years, and I don't think, and they have many good things and bad things to say about the internet, but none I've ever met have said, I wish my internet was more like my gas or water company. <laughs> uh, and if, in fact, every American was a broadband provider, I think that would only hasten the call for Congress to statutorily define what the rules should be for our conduct of our work as broadband providers. The other Jonathan. <laughs> so a couple of points on this. Users are critically important. Mm -hmm. I don't think as a matter of function they're providing, the, the engage in the same activity as broadband providers. It doesn't mean they're not important. It doesn't mean that they can't shape the environment. But they can only shape the environment if they can use the means of communication in an open way. And that policy is not depend, is not just Title II, it's the it is the internet policy that was adopted in 2005 by the commission and reiterated again and again that users should have the right to go to the places they want to, all assuming lawful activities, to conduct lawful activities. It might have been web pages, now it would be app, next, next year maybe artificial intelligence or the internet of things, but they all are dependent upon the network. And in fact, the notion, you know, Chairman Kennard was did a wonderful job, but at a time when he talked about light touch regulation, we ought not forget a lot of people were still making traditional telephone calls. That was Title II. A lot of people were adopting cell phones. That was Title II. A lot of people were going to AOL over their local dial tone. That was Title II. A lot of people were excited because they got to be able to buy DSL. That was Title II. It's not obvious to me as a matter of history that the use of the term light touch then is inconsistent with the Title II that was in effect. And then, if I can just say one last thing, because I think the point about users raises this. The Federal Communications Commission, right, is given authority to think about economic and not non-economic values. This is to not to say that they are never linked. Commissioner Olhausen <coughs> said that competition can serve free speech interests, and it can. To my mind, Justice Black's opinion in the Associated Press case is a good example of this, right? It was a classic antitrust case, and it served free speech interests. I don't think antitrust law by itself, though, can make decisions dependent only on non-economic interests. I think Congress has given the Federal Communications Commission the ability to protect diversity of speech independent of economic outcomes. And I think that's important because I think it is, just, it is simply because of the primacy of broadband communications that ensuring that political speech of different stripes can't be stopped or unpopular views not expressed, I think this becomes ever more important. If I can, if I can we, we, have, we have questions. I, I'd just like okay. to see whether uh, Jonathan Sallet's position, uh, there are people prepared to uh, answer that. Sure. Do you, yes. are, you, are we going to take more questions? Or are yeah. we? Yes, yes. Okay. But so just a quick, quick uh, uh, response to Jonathan S. No, they're both honest with Jonathan S. Yes, John that's exactly. Well, I, I, I don't. No, it's easy, Judge I, Williams. It's the Jonathan on the left. Right. Just say <laughs> I do have a quick response to um, Justice to Jonathan's response, and maybe I can kind of sneak in my response to this panel, this uh, attendee's response. I mean, I think, Jonathan, to your point about Title II having um, a uniform application over the years may be correct um, from that. But I think the, the danger of that, again, we were looking at a system that tended to be much more linear where consumers weren't driving that demand. I mean, I don't think that consumers should become personal broadband providers because consumers aren't engineers and don't know how networks work behind the scenes and you still need re you know, reasonable network management and you, need, you still need to manage that. But I do think consumers should choose if they want to uh, work with their healthcare provider to have some prioritization on whether or not they, they need those results quickly because they're dealing with cardiovascular issues. 
I do think consumers should have the ability to say that they want to be able to choose a program where they can offset Netflix because they watch that more and they want to be exempted um, of their minutes to be able to do so. And I think the current framework for which we have, which is a little different from when we were just picking up the phone and calling, you know, I, I try to tell people not to date myself. You know, when I grew up in, in, in New York, we had an, um, one of those trash things that you pulled the rope and we, uh, you could put your trash in and it would go all the way down to the incinerator. But we used it to call downstairs <laughs> and we'd open it up and say, hey, are you coming outside, you know? Was that a Title II? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. a Title II, right. <laughs> well, Title II was the phone, right? I still remember my NE6-2437 telephone number, right? But the internet is so much different, right? And that's part of the challenge that I think we're all facing. So I, I totally agree with you that consumers are driving the changing ecosystem. 2.2 billion users on Facebook, who would have thought that? Increasing numbers of millions that are downloading apps per day, who would have thought that? A trillion Internet of Things um, devices that will flood the marketplace in the next few years, none of us could have forecasted that. And so I think it's important to keep the end user, as we've all said at the end, and to say that we all do support open Internet. But I think we have to be careful, John, just when we look at the type of tightness of regulatory infrastructure that does not allow for that innovation to thrive based on what consumers want. And I think it's a little different if a consumer then becomes the subject of a net neutrality violation because they want to deal with United Healthcare to ensure that they get that data quicker. We have some questioners from the floor, so I thought we ought to turn to them, turn back to them. Um, so, uh, a can, legal can I question. Ask if, if it's not inconvenient, just identify. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Neil Chilson, I'm the acting chief technologist at the FTC, and now that my boss has left the room, I can <laughs> ask questions. Um, uh, a legal question. Jonathan, uh, as I understood your, your statement, uh, your position is that broadband is, that, that this is a Chevron step one question, that broadband. Uh, is a Title II service. Uh, there is no ambiguity in the statute. Um, I, obviously, you've taken a position that uh, many of us in the federal society uh, appreciate in that you're standing with Justice Scalia um, in Brand X, but uh, that is certainly not the position the FCC took in the 2015 order. It's certainly not the position the DC Circuit took. And I'm not even sure, uh, given what networks look like today, um, that it would be the position that Justice Scalia would take uh, if he was re-examining how networks today look, which is not your telephone that you're using a modem to connect over. Um, they're much more complicated in the middle. We have all these things like CDNs. We have prioritization that happens as traffic management, um, it, just slightly off the, uh, the last mile. And um, uh, it's a very complicated, very different factual system. And so my question is, why are, are you saying that the statute is clear and that broadband is clearly a, uh, it's a Chevron uh, step one question? Is that your argument? Um, my view is this. I mean, we had, I thought, two speakers before me suggest that the question could, should be analyzed, at least two speakers, without, without regard to Chevron step two. So if one takes that approach, I believe the answer is clear, which is broadband service is a, is a Title II service. The notion that the networks have changed, networks change, but they haven't changed in, in this respect. This is what Justice Scalia said. He said, the, I'm paraphrasing a little, the delivery service provided by cable is downstream from the computer processing facilities, and therefore he says, there is no question that it merely serves as a conduit for the information services that have already been assembled. Yeah. So when it's, I'm sorry, when a CDN at, at an interconnection point, when a CDN aggregates traffic and passes it to a network, uh, ISP network at an interconnection point, what happens thereafter is, I continue to believe, and I think consistent with Justice Scalia's description, the actions uh, merely of a conduit. And I continue to think that a 
view that suggests, as the NPRM did, that there is no telecommunications in a broadband service will not survive subsequent judicial review. And I guess I would just say at a, at a higher level, uh, you're using a lot of legal terms, uh, so interconnection point. Uh, these are things that where we have to draw lines in the legal world, you're right. Um, when the CDN is co-located in the same space as where, the, where Comcast is serving content as well, um, the network is getting really fuzzy there about whether it's a separate CDN or if it's part of the well, ISP's last mile network. Can I ask and, you a question? Yeah, if Comcast sure. charges for the connection, won't the economics of that interconnection contract provide a practical and economic, economically based understanding of where the line is to be drawn? Uh, well, yes. I mean, that's why I would say that, that but, but I would say if the economics, if that's what we're trusting is those negotiations, then I'm not sure why we're trying to uh, put um, some legal uh, parameters around the negotiations yeah. there. So I don't want to get into an interconnection. Yeah, the, um, but yes. <laughs> I mean, this is an argument that, that uh, my point of view was not uh, developed with the <laughs> refinement that I yes. would have liked to see back two and a half years ago. Yes. Uh, and I sort of despair of, of getting the, the refined argument that, uh, um, that we generally like to see. Well, for... All I'm saying, <laughs> Judge Williams, is this. If we have two parties and they're making a contract for the supply of services and they designate a point at which the services ought to be exchanged, I'm really not making a legal point. That really tells us something about where one party's obligations begin and another one ends. That's the only point I'm making. I think that just comes from the nature of the contracting process. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, over the years, I'll try to fit that into my <laughs> understanding of Title II. Anyway, we have a question from Thank over you. there. Uh, Brooks Harlow, I practice telecommunications law, and when I started doing that, um, the network was two tin cans and a string. <laughs> Uh, one editorial comment, and then I do have a question, but, but, but uh, Jonathan, I, um, I always thought that that court in little old Portland, Oregon got it right when they split the internet into two pieces. One was the network and the other was the ISP side. And, and then I'll go to Nicole, and I'm really glad you brought up poll attachments, and it harks back to Commissioner Carr's comment that we're going to need 700,000, almost three quarters of a million new cell sites, and they're going to be smaller. Okay, if you're going to do that, at a reasonable cost, to me, you're going to need poll attachments at regulated rates. Because uh, I've done poll attachment negotiations, and I know a regulated rate is 10% or less of what the competitive market rate is. So the question is, if the FCC presumably makes some changes to how the Internet is classified under the new administration, is there a way somehow to salvage Section 224 are you, which is the poll attachment uh, statute. Are you going to hang uh, poll attachment rates for what's really a 5G network? Are you going to hang it on the, on the voice that, that is probably coming out of that? What if it's voice over the top? Does it still work, or is it now back to Title I if they go back to Title I? You know, how, can, how can we practically and politically maybe preserve some poll attachment protection for these new networks that are going to require so many more cell sites. Mm. Yeah, I would just say on this, so I was part of, I wasn't part of the formal BDAG, but I was one of the working groups and learned more about poll attachments in the last eight months than I've ever wanted to know. That question never came up. I think it's a really fascinating question. I think it, um, the BDAG just has recently put out a series of recommendations, um, and it's interesting and worth exploring, right, because that, for everything from safety and reliability, location, the fees are all part of you know what will either enhance or hinder the type of deployment goals that this uh, administration wants. So I would say, and Rosalyn, you're not in your head. I mean, I think this is a question that in all of our working group meetings we really did not dig deeper in that, probably on purpose, just to keep the conversation going. But I think it's a worth really exploration, particularly as the BDAC takes on the next six months of new work. Um, some of those recommendations from the original BDAC, for those of you that's the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee that was convened by uh, Chairman Pai, they have presented some of those recommendations, some of which were adopted yesterday, uh, like overlashing, I think, and things like that. 
they've got another six months and this may be something worth sort of exploring as part of that conversation. Well, we have another question. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks, Judge. Uh, Alden Abbott, Heritage Foundation. Just a quick uh, comment. I think Jonathan Salop referred to correlation on implying causation is quite right with regard to investment. However, I believe it per may have been in the Journal of Industrial uh, Economics. There was a special issue with about eight or ten studies by economists of different stripes. And he just about universally, based upon their analysis and their data grubbing, concluded that indeed uh, uh, in, uh, in investment had been de-incentivized. So I, I think that, that there's a lot of empirical work out on that now. Uh, second, I think the whole issue about you know, prioritization and, and neutrality, quite apart from legal issues, the consumer protection issue, which the FTC handles so competently and with uh, such experience, really depends upon the consumer not having been given what he or she uh, bargained for, believed was reasonable under circumstances. That's to be distinguished from the whole idea of a, of a uh, sort of common carrier regulation which would make prioritization dif difficult. Where if you make it difficult, you in effect create cross-subsidization of overusers. And I think that uh, Nicole Turner Lee has pointed out to that, that those, and that is very inefficient. It's, in a way, it's like saying you can't have prioritization for better seats at the theater, better airplane uh, seats, and so forth. So just uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me respond to that. Well, first, I want to I want to thank Jonathan Sallet for being with us, and I think you're doing a fabulous job. I mean, you I know that you spent so much of your life to. Uh, to make these case, and you also wrote the broadband value circle, even though I think the virtuous circle violates the broadband value circle, but I think you're doing <laughs> a great job I say, on the, everybody on the panel. Everybody agrees that they're both circles. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they're both circles, thank you. So, but let me make two, so just a quick point In to follow, follow up with the question. If Title II is so great, why did the Department of Justice have to sue the FCC to break up AT&T? I mean, there was so much consumer harm of violating, uh, stuffing the profits over this collusion between AT&T and the FCC for decades. And why would we want to take that and put it on the internet? Well, there's very one good reason if you want to make a national broadband network. Now, a number of countries have done that. In Australia, for example, look it up. Now, in that case, when they decide to do it, they actually compensate the incumbent for the losses. 25% of the cost goes back to the, the incumbent uh, wireline provider. Um, in this case, we're not bothering to compensate the uh, private providers for their loss of property. We're just imposing, you know, we're just taking their property. The other thing to say, if you want the true case of the investment question under Title II, look at two war the two wireline networks, the DSL versus the cable plant. Uh, after the internet was commercialized. The investment in cable went through the roof and it dried up on DSL, okay? So that is empirically shown. I know we have a lot of debate now about the various investment questions. It's difficult to look at, but the other part I would say, 75,000 jobs lost from 2015 to 2017 under Title II. Those small providers, they said, we can't get loans from our local bank because the FCC can come in and regulate our price once we have put the wires in the ground. It's too risky for us. So they have pulled back on what they're doing. I think that's really something that matters. And, and finally, this question about the economics. You know, I went through, I wrote up my PhD on this topic. I read 10,000 articles on economics this way or the other. The open internet order did not dignify or recognize the hundreds of economists who submitted combined all of the, um, uh, the, com the literature on this topic says it's ambiguous. It's ambiguous. If you make an assumption that users value content the same, yes, it, it might work. But we know they don't value it all the same. So the economics about net neutrality shows ambiguous results. And there's no prescription that says this kind of regulatory regime gets you the best outcome. That's not there. And you know, we, uh, my apologies to the judge because we've um, re rehashed a, lo a, lot of, a lot of these things, but the <laughs> economists there at the FCC, I mean, the poor man was put in the broom closet. You know, the, the economists were, uh, they were not in included. Um, 
because it didn't support that result. Now, I'm, you know, there are some economists who testified, but you have to look at the assumptions that they had to support a particular kind of outcome. Jonathan on the right has a <laughs> comment. Um, to the gentleman from Heritage who pointed out, I think appropriately and importantly, that uh, it is though it's difficult to ascertain if it's a correlation causation uh, impact on investment or CapEx as a result of Title II. The facts on the ground, though, are, are very poignant and very jarring. In fact, just a couple hours ago, my organization published to augment the record at the FCC a letter from about 21 very small providers in our, our nation's heartland, often with several thousand uh, square miles of service area, but customer books that only included a hundreds, uh, numbered in the hundreds or maybe in the thousands. And to a person, these 22 rural providers uh, wrote to our commissioners at the Federal Communication Commission, explaining that without the clarity and parity that is required um, for them to have that clear line of sight and the confidence and trust that they can wisely make investments in their network, specifically in, in, in difficultly to carry the increasing burdens that they're seeing in terms of the throughput and the, that's coming in terms of the data packets over their networks from an increasingly small group of over-the-top providers, the deeply, deeply economically challenging task of doing so, uh, and, uh, exacerbated by the economically challenging models of drawing more broadband to the still several millions of Americans who do not yet have it. Um, that the imposition of Title II has only made things worse. Um, is there a silver bullet? Uh, I don't know. But to Jonathan Sallet's, I think, very important point, one which, with which we're entirely aligned, which is that to a person, these 21, and in fact, I would think that the couple thousand American broadband providers are in entire agreement. This is not about differing on whether these customers uh, now and in the future should or should not have access to a, a truly open and neutral and free <laughs> internet. They should. This is merely an important discussion and debate about how best to create the regulatory frameworks to allow them to do so. Our perspective is if we come back to a, a, a vision, a bipartisan vision uh, led by an, uh, clear signals from Congress about what that framework should be and which regulatory agency should be assigned the responsibility for its implementation, that's the best place to start. Can I just very briefly? We have 20, we have 20 seconds each from <laughs> okay. uh, I can commenters do, no, to my just, left. On the paid prioritization point, I, I, let me do this quickly. Part of the paid prioritization rule now in effect says a broadband provider can't advantage its own affiliate. Right? This is a very important notion. Sometimes we talk about broadband companies as if they were sort of floating in the ether. These are vertical, by and large, and certainly the big broadband companies, are vertically integrated entities. And what we see from the merger reviews to which I referred earlier is the Department of Justice and the FCC again and again finding that where these vertical arrangements exist, the entities have, and these are massive records, right, probably millions of documents that demonstrate these broadband providers have the incentive and have the ability to take actions to disadvantage competition, OVDs being the classic case, with adverse consequences to horizontal <coughs> competition that would otherwise serve consumers. In other words, excluding OVDs who could be competing against the video side of the broadband business. That's not hypothetical. That's millions of pages of documents, careful analysis, complaints filed in federal court, and orders issued by the commission. Jonathan, that's not 20 seconds. <laughs> 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 Dr. Turner Lee, you're 20 seconds. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> I'll just say this, and um, you know, I want to just reiterate, I'm at Brookings, so it, it, you know, I tell people I've been able to sort of recover on some sleep and do other things as a result of not being in the middle of the uh, uh, advocacy debate on this issue. But I think the conversation that we had here today 
really speaks to, I think, a lot of the challenges and the tensions that exist in this debate, which is one of the reasons why I think Congress, again, needs to come in and act on this so that we can look at these issues in a way that um, allows Congress to provide us with a roadmap going forward. But the last thing I would just like to say in five seconds is we've talked a lot about investment. We've talked a lot about the statute. We still need to keep in mind the ramifications of the Title II reclassification on other areas like universal service fund contribution. With a consolidated marketplace, the contribution rate, the net, you know, the net neutrality provisions, there's a possibility of that. And we want to be careful of creating lopsided markets. Uh, the, the content providers that are riding off of these networks make billions of dollars in advertising. The telecommunication provider, by far, their share, uh, proportionate share is much less. So going forward, I think there has to be these conversations that look at the, like this gentleman said, the overall impact, uh, both economically, societally, and obviously, you know, long term, so that innovation is not choked, and consumers at the end are the ones that are the biggest losers as a result of our stalemate here in Washington, D.C. So I'll leave it at that. A nice note <laughs> to end on. Can we have a round of applause for the panelists? <laughs> That's right. <laughs>